All right. So our last talk before the break is uh, from Anna Schurer about the formation of the first stars in the universe. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, so also thank you from me uh, for letting me speak here at this wonderful online conference. Um, I'm Anna Schauer, I'm a postdoc at UT Austin, and I'd like to share some results from my simulations, as well as um, from uh, some semi-analytical work that we did very recently. So when we look at the time evolution of the universe, we can observe the cosmic microwave background at a redshift of over a thousand. And then we have this big gap in time until we can observe the first galaxy at a redshift 11 um, or the first black hole at roughly a redshift of seven. The first stars, however, form in a redshift range of roughly 30 to 10. So with James Webb, we will be able to target this region. However, James Webb will not be able to see um, a single population of population D stars because um, it's not, they are not luminous. They sit in tiny halos that I will show you later. So what we do or what I do is I run computer simulations and I do theoretical modeling um, to understand better when the first stars of the universe formed. So here I show you the a number density slice of my simulation at uh, Redshift 15. So I run simulations with a code Arepo it's a moving mesh code. Um, I have dark matter, I have gas, um, and I also have primordial chemistry included, uh, which uh, mainly contains molecular hydrogen. That's uh, a very important molecule because it's the one way we can cool uh, a mini halo down to temperatures below the atomic cooling limit. So it really is the way to jump from the temperature of 10,000 Kelvin to roughly 200. My simulations are one megaparsec uh, in box size. Uh, run from a redshift of 200 down to a redshift of 14, um, and the strength of it are the resolution. So I have a resolution in dark matter of roughly 100 solar masses and then gas of roughly 20 solar masses. So when I now look for the first uh, objects, the first teeny tiny galaxies, so-called mini halos, in which those stars are forming, um, I can find many hundreds of those objects and they are nicely resolved. Um, and I show you here um, a zoom in into one of those uh, small mini halos. You can see it's like a very filamentary structure and we have a high density core here. And those objects typically have masses of a few times 10 to the five to uh, 10 to the seven solar masses. And uh, like this picture is a zoom in, but my simulation is not a zoom simulation. So I have a uniform uh, mass resolution throughout the whole uh, simulation. Uh, which is nice because I can then resolve my mini halos. For studying the really early universe, we need to go back a little bit and I need to talk about an effect that's very important for the first stars um, and that dates back to before recombination. Those are the so-called streaming velocities. So at those very, very early times in the universe, um, the universe is very dense and very hot. Uh, so we have this coupling of our photons to the gas. On the right, I show you a cartoonish picture on a very large scale. So we have dark matter in dark and we have um, gas in blue. And we can see that here in this region of the universe, a dark matter uh, over density is growing. The gas doesn't follow that because when the dark matter can fall into its own potential wall and increase, um, uh, the, the, the gas, however, um, is pushed outwards from the pressure. So we do have a velocity offset in some regions of the universe um, between the gas and the dark matter before recombination. Um, and you can see that some of the regions of the universe have a large velocity offset. For example, here in the region I'm pointing out with my mouse here uh, next to the center, uh, whereas in other regions over here, um, we don't have a really big velocity offset um, and the gas and the um, dark matter are moving uniformly. So Moving to large scales, we can see that we have regions of the universe where we are synchronization between um, gas and dark matter, and in other regions of the universe, we are have a large offset velocity. How big is this offset velocity? At recombinations, it's 30 kilometers per second. Um, then as the universe expands, the velocity gets smaller. So a typical um, first star formation redshift of 20, it's about half a kilometer per second as it is decaying. And here you can see like 
on how large scales um, this uh, velocity different plays a role. So this is 400 megaparsec. And what we do with our simulations, because they are just one megaparsec big, we can now run different simulations in different spots of our larger scale. And what we do is we artificially insert a streaming velocity into our initial conditions. So what we do is we have the same initial conditions, but then um, introduce an additional velocity in X direction to mimic those different streaming velocity regions. And we can do that because our box is relatively small compared to this coherent length of uh, three megaparsec. So let me now show you my slice again at the redshift of 15 for the simulation I showed you before with no streaming velocity. So where um, we don't have an artificial or an additional offset velocity between dark matter and baryons. And let me now move through my um, streaming velocity values of higher streaming velocities. And as you see, this image gets more blurry. I didn't change the technique how I produced this picture. This is really the physical effect that we see when the gas is moving with a high relative velocity with respect to the dark matter. Um, that structure formation um, in the gas um, is delayed. So having the same picture here um, on the left, as I showed you before in those four slides, and then having zoom ins uh, for 20 kiloparsec and then two kiloparsec, what we can see is those streaming velocities, they wash out uh, the structure in the gas. Um, the maximum density uh, decreases that we can reach in the gas. And this of course has an effect on star formation um, because stars ultimately form out of the dense um, gas. And if uh, our dense gas isn't present in a galaxy or in a mini halo, then we cannot form stars there. So where we can still form stars is when we move to larger halos. So with larger halos, they have a larger potential and they can attract, still attract gas. And those larger halos form large later in the universe due to hier hierarchical structure formation. So overall streaming velocities delay star formation. Streaming velocities delay star formation uh, in the early universe. We now need to take into account also a second effect, the so-called Lyman-Werner radiation. That's a feedback effect. Um, the first stars emit radiation and they also emit it in the wavelength in the energy range of 11.2 to 13.6 EV, um, which is the range that destroys molecular hydrogen. And when we don't have molecular hydrogen, we lose our coolant. So again, I show you simulation boxes um, with no Lyman-Werner background a weak Lyman-Werner background and a strong Lyman-Werner background. And with no Lyman-Werner background, what you can see is that um, the low density regions in between the filaments do have molecular hydrogen and that completely disappears when we have a Lyman-Werner background present. In our halos, so zooming in again to 20 kiloparsec and then two ki kiloparsec, we see that we still retain molecular hydrogen less so with a stronger Lyman-Werner background um, because Lyman-Werner uh, radiation can be self-shielded by molecular hydrogen. So as soon as we have a big enough halo um, with enough gas, um, molecular hydrogen can self-shield in that halo. And in those cases, star formation is still possible because the gas can still cool and become very dense in the center. But we again need to move to larger halos um, and therefore um, star formation generally is suppressed. And because those larger halos form later in the universe, star formation is also delayed. If we now compare those two effects, so I, I show you now the combined two uh, effect slide. Uh, if you compare the bottom point of those, it's exactly the same. So both effects um, delay star formation. Um, and we ask ourselves the question, what is the interplay between those effects? Which one plays the stronger role? And of course, in our case, the solution to this problem is running more simulations. So we increased our simulation sample from four simulations with different streaming velocities and three simulations with no streaming velocity, but um, different Lyman Werner backgrounds to a combination of those. And then we study the average halo mass for star formation. So how massive does a halo need to be to form stars? And what you can see here is um, the halo mass is a function of streaming velocity. And you can see this 
increases, as we've seen before and understood before, um, for both increasing streaming velocity and then in different colors, I have the different Lyman Werner backgrounds and it increases also for different Lyman Werner backgrounds. But the streaming velocity plays the larger role. This increase here is larger than that increase here. And in order to characterize not only those 12 combinations, um, we applied a fitting formula and uh, it works very nicely because most of the universe um, has a streaming velocity between zero and one sigma. So when we take that into account, we can fit roughly 97% of the universe accurately based on those models with our fitting formula. As a last point, I would like to say, what do we want to do when we want to move away from the supercomputers and actually observe those population three stars directly at the time that they are born? Um, and for that, we did a fun little paper that came out yesterday on archive. It's, um, yeah, we submitted it to APJ letters. So we have here the flux uh, of population three and population two sources with uh, very known models uh, from Sackerson and uh, from Brom 2001. And uh, we estimate that fiducially we have a thousand solar masses and stars. And in one of the models, we have a nebula in this one, and in this one, we don't. And we put them through the near camp filters of James Webb. And what we find is when we have an AB magnitude of uh, 39, then we can take population three stars. So we can see the majority of the population three stars in both models, uh, but we can't really see the pop two stars. And this is exactly what we want. And we also check that those can be detected and can be clearly identified as population three stars. So those here are brown dwarfs and they occupy only a minimal fraction of uh, the space and those are only the very cloudy, cloudy brown dwarfs. And then there was a paper by Engel et al. 2008, who suggested a 100 te meter telescope on the moon. And this is um, the telescope necessary to reach this 39th magnitude. So if you're interested in this uh, thought experiment, um, I would invite you to check out uh, yesterday's archive. And yeah, I... I leave you with my conclusions and I hope you have a few questions for me. Thank you. All right, thank you. That's great. And we're finally get to 100 meter telescopes. Um, so uh, on the Slack, there are a few questions. The first is from Xiao Han Wu. Uh, he, she said, I probably misunderstood this, but is initial condition not generated by a self consistent calculation with a linear perturbation theory, or just imposing a relative velocity between dark matter and gas? There are papers commenting on the accuracy of this type of intercondition generation. Could you comment on how this affect your results? Okay, so there's indeed, um, when you have larger simulation boxes, you need to take more into account um, that you have an effect. However, there has been a paper, I think this year from Yunbei Park uh, that comments that um, it actually plays a very minor role uh, to um, take into account the temperature fluctuations that are associated um, with the uh, um, fluctuations um, of the velocities. Um, so because our box sizes are quite small um, and because of Yunbei's paper, I think we are quite safe with the way we set up our initial conditions. Of course, like the dark matter um, density and fluctuations are created with a proper initial conditions code called, we use music for that. All right, thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, Let's see which one. There are a lot of questions actually. Is the Lyman Warner background in your simulation imposed or produced by the stars in your simulation? No, it's imposed. Um, so in order to do this parameter study, um, it is not a self-consistent, but it is an external Lyman Werner background. Uh, we turn it on at the redshift where we first uh, find um, our star formation conditions uh, to be fulfilled, which is redshift 24. Um, Okay, we have time for one last question. What is the H2 temperature and how is it determined? Mm, so um, you probably mean the temperature. Um, so oh wait, I have a slide for that. Um, so the H2 temperature um, can reach temperatures of 200 Kelvins. Um, 
and um, that is determined by the row vibrational states of molecular hydrogen.